Okay. Oh, wait, sorry. Email. Check it Check it Yeah. You said he already. He's in nutrition and food safety. Yeah. So exactly. Uh, I'll start it here. Here. Yeah, try him and then, but I would just ask him because he may not be perfect, but he can speak. Yeah, yeah, Bruce Gordon, sorry. Yeah, you, oh, um, I copied it, so yeah, you just pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, so all that is, uh, there's, I think there's been some rumor that it's all stopped, but it, it, so what we have stopped doing is actively subsidizing the testing, but if people are desperate to test something, it's still good, and you can still submit it to the lab and get a certification. But it's just that, yeah, we don't, we, we feel like we've, we got to, yeah. Well, with this, with this, what we do, well, I mean, it's always zero E. coli, but um, but um, for the the water testing, we do it in a we do it per pathogen. Um, so we do. You have to have a certain amount of log inductions um, for uh, uh, bacteria class, the um, viruses, and then cryptosporidium. And then you basically, I forget the numbers now, but one might be four log inductions, ninety nine point nine nine percent. And then you have to, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, that's that's still. But are you in touch with Batsy or? Yeah. Yeah. She's still being paid. She's still being paid. Okay, this still paid. This okay. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just going to get mad at it. Yeah, well, okay. So if you left and then you asked me to do you Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if that looks good to you, I want it. Yeah. Oh, I did that. I should have said it's The leader. Okay. Better to have. Uh, so we come up here. Go ahead, put that in. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying that. This one. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, sure. 
Okay. Yeah, if you just do name and Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm Yeah, two times. Thank you. Yeah, I thought it was weird, but I don't know why this looks okay. Let me, I just want to make a quick edit. Oh, it is. Sorry. Oh, that's cool. All right, welcome everyone to the Dogwood Room. Um, unfortunately, there were there was a change of topics during the planning of this conference, so please note that 
this session will not be menstrual hygiene management, but water quality. So uh, hopefully that's not as too much of a surprise to folks, judging from the title of this given so far. But uh, that aside, uh, please, please, everyone give a warm welcome to uh, Tula Musala from Michigan State University. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, so today I'll be sharing about um, the work we, um, we've we done in Pwani, Tanzania, and uh, its topic is determinants of risks in shallow wells. So as we all know, um, inadequate access to water and sanitation is, is responsible for so many deaths. and. Um, and many peri-urban communities in developing countries, especially, uh, often uh, have inadequate supply of municipal water, non-existent sanitation systems, and and even just basic services like, you know, lack of road and infrastructure in general poses a lot of issues, especially in informal settlements. So the study area is in Pwani, Tanzania. I just wanted to show a map there, just so you have an idea where Pwani is. It's towards the east, very close to Indian Ocean, um, and it's just bordered with Dar es Salaam. So uh, in Pwani, uh, communities usually rely on uh, heavily on shallow wells. These are dug, hand dug wells. Um, these are you know cheap; they dig them themselves. Um, water is usually free. Um, and so the problem is they're very seasonal. Uh, you know, it's like during dry season, most of them dry up or the, you know, water level drops significantly. Most of them are unprotected, poorly constructed. And uh, I think the biggest of all is they are high risk of contamination due to poor sanitation practices. So this picture is just showing a few of them. Um, uh, these are most of them, 80% of the wells there are like this. They're not covered, um, not lined appropriately. A few of them are raised like the one on the left there. Um, so that's the condition of the hand dug wells they're using. And 90% of the uh, residents, the, the community members use just a normal latrine, just like that picture, or it's some kind of uh, like that. It's just a pit on the ground and either uh, you have like, a, you know, like a hole, like a pit directly from the toilet or it will be offset a little bit. But ideally, you, you know, just get an idea how the, the uh, toilets are within the community. So uh, the objective of uh, the objectives were for this, uh, for this part of presentation, we actually have done a little bit more work on this. We looked at the water quality of all the wells, 40 wells that uh, were within the study area. We also looked at the well placement uh, variables like distance, depth, um, and age of the well, and you'd see how those affect the water quality. And also we looked at the physical condition of the well itself, like, you know, is it uh, covered, uh, broken, like all the physical conditions that can cause safety or harm to the residents. Uh, and quality of uh, water as well. So that was another part of, of the work we've done. But for this presentation, I'll only focus on the, the first two objectives, which is assess the quality of water on all domestic wells within the study area, and then looked at how the placement variables affect water quality. So distance um, from the well to the nearest pit latrine, uh, we know minimum is usually 15 meters or 50 feet. Uh, and then age of the well, usually the older the well, the higher the risk of contamination. And then um, also depth, um, you know, the shallower the wells, usually they're also in a high risk of contamination. And the soil here is sandy, clay, high, very high permeability, which also increases the risk. So we did uh, field observations from 40 wells within the community measured distance from the well to the nearest pit latrine, uh, nearest pit latrine. And uh, these wells are usually owned by somebody, but they are public public wells. So, you know, anybody can collect water from those wells. Water is usually free. 
And so when we measure distances, usually it will be from the nearest latrine, not necessarily from the owner's latrine. So sometimes you can be, uh, you own the well, but your neighbor is the one who is, you know, contaminating your water. And then we talk to the uh, well owners and ask them about the usage, uh, when the, de the well was constructed, depth, things like that. Um, and then we sampled every well um, and tested for physical parameters, chemical parameters, and biological parameters. So we tasted total of about 11 contaminants. And so that's just the map showing uh, where the sampling locations were in the community. So for the analysis, we used water quality index. And this is just to be able to assess the overall quality of uh, overall water quality of the wells. And so that way we'll get one number that will represent all the 11 parameters. So just the way it is, you will have your parameters, you'll have your uh, uh, water quality standard. So, you know, it's 500 for TDS, 2BDD and so forth. And then each uh, parameter will have a signed weight. So for, you know, for bacteria, for example, it's higher, you have a higher assigned weight than for something like hardness, you have a lower uh, um, assigned weight. And then you use the equation to calculate the relative weight. And then from there, you get your um, water quality index for each well. So each well had an, one number that represented a quality of that one. And then, so that's the table showing how we group those, uh, those indices. Uh, so excellent is anything less than 50, and then 300 and above will be as unsuitable for them. And then, um, so, uh, findings, um, so with the 40 wells we tested, if you look at the distance there, that dotted line is just showing the threshold of 15 meters uh, minimum. And we had, you know, more than half of the wells were uh, less than 15 meters, were located less than 15 meters from the nearest latrine. And then um, a lot of wells were pretty new. They were either constructed within five years, um, and most of them, you can see that from that, uh, most of them were two years and below, actually. And then uh, they were, uh, most of them were very shallow, at least 15 meters um, or less. And then, um, so for the water quality index from um, how, when we analyzed every well and calculated water quality index from the 11 uh, parameters, they actually split 50-50. We had 50% that scored good and excellent, and then we had 50 that were poor, very poor, and suitable for drinking. But one thing to note, the ones that were uh, excellent, um, those were the ones that were constructed within six months. So it's likely that over time, those wells will be, uh, the quality will uh, probably change. And so I just picked one of the 11 parameters just to show how, when, you know, when we did the analysis of each a contaminant, but turbidity, for example, we know five is minimum, and a lot of these wells were had a high turbidity levels. Five is the minimum that we know. So, um, you know, so and that's kind of like a spatial distribution of how uh, those wells are. And the the blue is a little bit of lower turbidity, and then as you keep going down, the colors are showing higher turbidity. Uh, we did do a uh, statistical analysis. I uh, I think I forgot to mention in the uh, methods there, but we did a, a bivariate correlation. We did a, a linear uh, linear linear uh, bivariate correlation analysis just to see if there's any significant there's any relationship between the contaminants and the edge distance and depth of the wells, and um, so we did in for contaminants individually, and then we did as a whole with the water quality index and the, the those three variables. And with age, we didn't, it wasn't significant that age was causing contamination based on this, uh, but for depth and distance, it was pretty uh, obvious that those were, you know, there, there was a strong correlation and they were statistically significant. Um, so we kind of had that conclusion where depth and distance were more, um, our, you know, our data with the 40 wells that we tested showed a significant um, result. So 
uh, I think we, you know, we kind of know that, like, like I should mentioned earlier, we our focus for this work was main for my presentation was to kind of look at those three main variables. Anywhere where we, we have either shallow wells or deep wells, you can use the same tool or the same method to try to figure out if you know the distance of the by looking at all three uh, variables and see if there's really a significant um, contribution to uh, contamination of wells. And with our findings, we found that age wasn't an issue, but as much, although with literature does show over time, wells do get contaminated as they keep being used. And so we do uh, have a, we know that future work, um, like I've mentioned, we have more work that we have done with this, but we just didn't have time to present everything here. We looked at the safety, health risk, well owner users because of the unsafety of the wells themselves being uncovered, open, um, and very poor quality. And then future work you know, will include things like spatial variable, soils and aquifer materials. So looking at different soil types, not just one specific soil type uh, to monitor temperature changes. Non-point sources also can cause contamination, not just the groundwater, not just the, uh, the seeping, seepage of ground, you know, the contamination from like latrines. So considering surface water and things like that. And also doing a comparison wet season versus dry season and looking at the wells that can actually survive the dry season what the quality will look like. That's it for my presentation. Thank you. Do you have questions? Uh, so that our online audience. Yeah, we'll take questions. Thanks for that. And just to comment on the, the risk of shallow wells during outbreaks, uh, I know in some of the previous cholera outbreaks, shallow wells were uh, so, well, implicated in some of the areas with lots of cases. My question was, you mentioned that your very last bullet about wet season, and I assume that most of these samples were done during the dry season. Are you going to repeat it? Because you'd expect those some of those results would change during the heavy rainy season. And then when you showed the distance associated with uh, the, the results uh, on the index, can you make any, uh, draw any conclusions about whether that 50 feet or 15 meters is appropriate or what would be a better distance based on your results? Thanks. Yeah, so actually there's a, another paper actually that was published and I, I did a modeling um, to kind of look at the specific soil types. Like you just put in all the soil conditions and, and, and the distances and everything it will, and then it will, Tell, or give an estimate of what will be safe. Uh, you know, so it doesn't, 15, 15 meters is really a generalized number, but if you look into it, you'll see that some areas, maybe it's 20, some areas, maybe it's 10. Um, so we didn't do that part for this work, but there is a paper that um, is published that talked about that and it, we did some more. Thanks. I thank you so much for, for the wonderful research. And uh, I, I would like to know whether they are, the study can, can go beyond that uh, on contamination of water and go to nearby health facilities to see whether, how many cases of, uh, uh, how many cases reported to sanitation, not to health facilities uh, due to drinking unsafe water thank you yeah yeah that's a good question so part of the survey actually one of the questions that we ask is you know what are the common um diseases that are reported we usually don't mention related to water we will just kind of ask about the common diseases and diarrhea um all the waterborne diseases are very especially for children are really high in that area but we did in in that community specifically but we didn't include that data uh for this study but it's it's obvious that um it does cause health issues but i i would like to say maybe that can be a, a just to focus on health you know health healthcare facilities and looking at the data just the data that are related to waterborne that that could be a, a you know study on its own. 
think for the question. We'll do one more question. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the study and thank you for the presentation. Um, it struck me that um, for most of the wells that you studied, they are less than two years old. And uh, this suggests that these neighborhoods are rather new or uh, people have just settled in these places because as soon as people settle in a place, they will most likely get a well, drill a well or dig a well. So um, what would you say to them? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question too. So no, it's not a new neighborhood, but because because of wells, because of because of being seasonal, because the wells are pretty seasonal, so they will drill a well and it will stay for maybe it will go through two seasons and then it will dry up, and then they'll wait for another rain se rainy season and they'll dig up another well. So it's kind of like they go like that. So it's not a very reliable way of you know, having a water source really, but um it, it is the reality and that's how that's how they they survive. Uh, please welcome Mesra Jessalay from the Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Mesra Jessalay from the Aqua So continuing to uh, talk about water quality, I will be sharing you our findings. So and this work entitled Five Water is Coordinated for Disease. This is the evidence uh, from Ethiopia, Ghana, and Canada. This work is uh, done in a collaboration between the Aquaya Institute and Mada Institute of Technology uh, in Ethiopia. So as a background, um, you know, only 62% of the rural areas are safely managed water in 2020. And uh, in order to increase uh, uh, this level and then to achieve uh, SDGs by 2030, there is an overall Excuse. Thank you. There is an overall increase that is needed, about six-fold increase is needed to uh, achieve the SDG goals. And to achieve these safely managed uh, water systems, you know, five water systems are very vital in order to achieve uh, these SDGs and also to deliver water on premises. And low and middle-income countries are, you know, uh, setting ambitious targets to increase these uh, five systems. Uh, in line with the And talking about the five systems, we, we know that fluorine is the most common method of treatment and also very cost effective. And it's also estimated to reduce child mortality by 40%. And there are recommendations um, which are set uh, for the residual fluorine levels in the water. And for example, the WHO recommends the minimum of 0.2 milligram per liter to be uh, in the water as a point of delivery for household connections. And there is also a new guideline which sets a minimum of 0.5 milligram per liter if the water is at the point of delivery for public taps or kiosks that require further transportation and stuff. And there are also other local guidelines. For example, if we look to Ethiopia, the Ethiopian guideline says maximum recommended value of 0.5. Um, Ghana says 0.2, but there's also a statement that says like in the distribution channels, it's better to have, it's safe to have 0.2 to 0.5. And Uganda is from 0.2 to 0.5. And uh, you can find, you know, different local regulations here. So coming to the objectives of this specific study, uh, we wanted to know uh, from a sample of, you know, five water systems in three sub-Saharan countries that are Ethiopia, Uganda, and Ghana. First, we wanted to understand, you know, the extent of rep reported water treatment and sufficient chloride. And secondly, we wanted to determine, you know, the factors associated with, with that of five water being safe or free from the collective pollution. So coming to the methods, um, you know, since 2022, Aquaya has been 
doing water quality monitoring in order to collect you know, longitudinal water quality across these different countries. In, and we have like seven districts in these three countries. And while doing that, you know, uh, we select, we identified public water supplies uh, in those selected enumeration areas and also in institutions. And then um, at each visit, we do surveys and also uh, in, in different visits, up to four visits, uh, we have also revisited these, these already identified public water areas. And in the surveys also we ask about, you know, uh, the construction, the operation of that water supply. And we also tested um, the water for E. coli by membrane filtration. And we also measured turbidity, pH, electrical conductivity, and uh, pre chlor residual by using the visual uh, comparator. And for now we have completed up to four visits from 2022 to 2022. So um, as I told you, this is like um, a long and very huge data set. And then from this, we extracted about 993 samples from 422 piped system taps. So we sampled from the taps. And these taps actually included, um, as you can see here, mechanized boreholes, public stand pipes, and also on floor taps. So to answer those, two specific objectives for the first one, to understand the extent of reported water treatment and sufficient chlorine dosing, we have used the summary statistics of the data plus um, mixed effect logistic regression with the outcome of interest being pre chlorine residual having a minimum of 0.2 milligram per liter. For the second one, for determining the associated factors with safer water quality, we have the outcome of interest being equally undetectable is someone for this. So when we come to the results, first let us see the characteristics of the piped system samples. So uh, when we look at this one, like majority of these samples were extracted in Ghana, about 60%, followed by Uganda and uh, Ethiopia. And six in 10 of these samples were from the community water points and others were uh, schools and healthcare facilities. And more than half of these pipe systems, they were sourced from the boreholes. And more than six in 10 also reported to have a continuous uh, supply. And 43% of those were constructed by the individuals and then 27% by the government and uh, 26 by the community. So talking about the reported uh, treatment measures, um, there were different options for the treat for treating the water. So those being like filtration only, chlorination only, chlorination plus filtration, and also no treatment, right? So what was reported was about 72% was reported of the water was reported to be chlorine. But when we actually measure the residual free chlorine, what we have found is only 17% had a free chlorine residual, which was greater than or equal to 0.2 milligrams. And if you look through the higher concentrations, which were greater than two, it was only 2%. And when we look through the new guideline, which says greater than or equal to 0.5, for these type of systems that require further transportation, these, these values get very lower to 0.1%. And then we were interested to see also, you know, which water systems were actually associated or more likely to have a free chlorine residual in the water. First, we saw reported to be chlorinated, you know, for those which were reported to be chlorinated. This is not a very surprise, like, those who were reported to be chlorinated were positively associated to have or uh, likely to have the free chlorine residual uh, with this odds ratio. And when we, when we look into the construction, like who constructed these water points, we have observed that those water points constructed by the national government 
பேருக்கு நீங்க பேசாது லைக் சே ஹார்ட் சே ஹார்ட் தே ஆர் லைக் யூ டு ஹாவ் யூ நோ எ ஃப்ரீ குளோரின் ரெசிடுவல் அபௌட் டுவைஸ் தான் சோஸ் வி ஆர் கன்ஸ்ட்ரக்டட் பை தி अदर ஃபீல்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் வி ஆல்சோ ஃபைண்ட் அவுட் தட் யூ நோ சோஸ் வாட் ஆர் சாம்பிள்ஸ் மேஜர் இன் தி ட்ரை சீசன் வேர் மோர் லைக்லி டு ஹாவ் எ ஃப்ரீ குளோரின் ரெசிடுவல் தான் சோஸ் வேர் மேஜர் இன் தி வெட் சீசன் and coming back to the microbial water quality uh we found out that you know half of our piped systems or the samples had um undetectable e coli and we tried to look through these results with the water having different free flow residual levels so what's interesting here to see is that like you know if you see the green plots from this end here it was not like very high like samples having 0.2 mg per liter free chlorine residual they were not very too much different with the other one and here with 0 to 0.1 mg per liter here i can i can say that most of these samples had zero free chlorine residual but like you know when you see the difference here it was not like it was not like much but like when this concentration was higher you can see more samples see um have safer quality and uh we also did statistical association for the um safer water quality and uh, here with outcome of interest being undetectable e coli we have we have seen that you know more safe water were um positively associated with the free chlorine residual of minimum of 0.2 mg per liter and we also identified that you know um like piped water source being spring it was negative negatively associated with uh, the safer water like it was more safe when it was sourced from the poor pools and the springs and this was also like having a safe water was also negatively associated with being um sampled from the dry season this was actually uh, uh, like it was not like what we commonly observe but it was it was uh, this was the observation and then also with high ph so it was negatively associated with these three factors so in general as a summary we have observed that you know most of these piped water systems they didn't achieve adequate chlorine dosing about 83% of them they didn't really achieve um, the minimum value and as you as you as you remember about three quarters were reported to be chlorinated so this is not enough and these chlorine residuals were consistently lower in the wet season and the other one about the microbial contamination we have observed that you know half of these piped water distribution samples had e coli from the piped water systems and we also observed from the statistical association that you know water was safer when it had a minimum concentration of 0.2 mg so uh, we have put this discussion and recommendation points for the first one you know it's not surprising our results confirm a well known fact that is chlorinated water supplies are safer for consumption right but if you remember those who are chlorinated were very very small like you know it was less than 1 in 4 which was chlorinated so 3 quarter was reported to be chlorine and you know many systems you know aren't achieving the necessary chlorine levels as as we as we have seen and the residual chlorine was significantly lower in the wet season so like we recommend you know increasing the chlorine dosing particularly in this season would be helpful and international and national chlorine residuals vary we have seen that and also from the results as you remember you know when you think of like 0.5 mg per liter the new guidelines say the new guideline the WHO guideline says 0.5 mg per liter minimum and if you remember those guidelines i showed you 0.5 was put as a maximum but right so uh, harmonizing this uh, residual chlorine dosing would be also helpful and finally you know um there is a challenge on how to achieve a better pipe dosing system treatment you know the reasons are vary actually we can list so many reasons for this so um starting from the supply chains you know the capacity development many things we can we can list but 
like as a recommendation, um, like, you know, encouraging the capacity of the water systems uh, to overcome this, um, this problem is as a recommendation. So finally, to uh, conclude, we want to shout out that, you know, effective pipe water treatment needs to be improved in order to achieve the SDGs and also protect the public health. Thank you very much. If you want to know more about our work, you can uh, go through through these links, more of our past work. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very elaborate uh, presentation. I was just wondering, what would the levels of turbidity be for this water? What was around the turbidity levels and uh, did it contribute to um, to some of the uh, chlorine residual and maybe even the microbial? Because uh, again, looking at the wet season, dry season, uh, well, how is it like? Or maybe other parameters that you could associate. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. As you know, turbidity values vary seasonally. So we collected this data seasonally. So we have seen that in the wet season, the turbidity increases. So I think that that could probably link to the chlorine doses. Like we see, we saw uh, very low levels of chlorine in the wet season. So that could be also related. Hmm. It varies actually, like, uh, you know, mainly higher than 10, I can say. Yeah, in the wet season mainly. Hello, over here. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering about the quantity. You looked at the quality. My question is more like, is the water, I, I might have missed this, sorry if I miss it, but uh, is the water provided 24 seven throughout the entire year? And uh, if not, is the water stored um, in tanks? Uh, and have you conducted any tests like chlorine levels at the storage and not just in the taps? Uh, it's because chlorine is very reactive and volatile, so it's less than 24 hours. You might not have any, any other chlorine left. So, yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So, um, like we have the data about the supply. So we ask it when we visit, uh, you know, the water points, we ask it about the supply, whether it's continuous or not. Actually, we have that data. But as regards to the storage, yes, we did that. We measured free chlorine at the storage. The result was not included here, but uh, uh, we also measured at the household level. And uh, yeah, we found some at the household level, especially since most of the samples from Uganda had more chlorine. And uh, we also find some chlorine in the households, but these results didn't uh, actually include that one. Yeah. Thanks so much for this presentation. Really well done. Um, I'm, I'm curious, two related questions, one being what kinds of chlorination were being performed and in the cases where they were reportedly confirming or reportedly chlorinating, did you all confirm that that chlorination was happening? Very good question. Uh, we didn't, we, we measured the chlorine level. We are not really, you know, confirming whether that's done or not, but we measured the chlorine level, yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Evans from the University of Birmingham. Uh, I have uh, two quick questions. The first one is trying to find out the chlorine levels for the various types of water sources. Because I noticed that you mentioned of boreholes. So in Ghana, boreholes are not um, are, are different as compared to the piped ones where it's supplied by the Ghana Water uh, Water Water Company, where the, chlor uh, the chlorine is done there and it's passed to the households, but this was quite different, like boreholes versus dark wells and other things. So I noticed that you showed some futures. Could we, and also with the boreholes, some boreholes are mechanized that it flows in and they add additional chlorine or additional filtration and other things before it gets through as compared to the manual ones that they do not. So is there any difference that you saw within this? How did you compare them across countries? Thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, what you have, uh, what may, you may have seen in the first slide or the second one is like we asked, you know, what is the source of this uh, 
pipe system. So those who are which were listed as borehole, mechanized borehole, those are like the source of the pipe system. So I don't know if I got your question. So those are like the pipe, like where does this tap water come from? And then those were the sources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I wanted to find out is how different the chlorine levels were like across the countries, depending on the water source. So for example, if it was borehole versus the pipes where it's supplied from the company. And I think a, a colleague mentioned earlier about the treated and kept somewhere and is supplied daily. How different was it across countries with, with these different sources in terms of their chlorine levels? I can't yeah. say like across countries, this was almost, I mean, it followed like the similar trend. Like, I mean, I, I cannot say like this country, this type was better. It was, it, it followed like the same type of trend. But specifically with the source, I may have to look at the data and tell you like this one is much better. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that one should. Okay. All right, uh, next, please welcome Yusuf Yara from the University of Mexico, as well as uh, Samira Lanseki Holland from University of Missouri. Good morning, everyone. We're going to just hold you like the thing, just a short introduction from me. I'm Samira Lanseki Holland. I'm from, um, so this work was done, as was explained by the, in collaboration between these two universities as part of a bigger study called the Marchiwara study, which is a, a complementary food hygiene and nutrition project, actually, under across 120 communities in urban and rural Mali. Um, this uh, is a sub-study uh, which took place to look at, uh, look at a particular pollutant that we don't normally talk about in water, um, microplastics, which are, as you know, ubiquitous in, in environment both in the air that we breathe actually in every country, in the water we drink and in the food that we eat. Um, as uh, you probably know, these are suspected to cause a gamut of conditions, health conditions, due to the additives that plastics carry with them, as well as the particles that microplastics actually represent, and the fact that the microplastic particles themselves can be carriers of either pathogens or other dam damaging chemicals. Um, the actual health effects of them is still under investigation in the very early days of studies, um, but um, microplastics have been found, not the additives, but the plastics themselves, of course, additives in many parts of the body, including placenta, testes, and various other places, which shows that they're obviously penetrating. Exactly what they do, and we don't know, but they have been found in inflammatory conditions, which can range from cancers to heart disease to um, various other conditions. I don't want to take the time of this very interesting study that my colleague has done in Mali um, across these number of communities. I should also say that usually these studies are very small, only small samples. This is only a pilot of the thousands of samples we've got, but still it's quite large as the literature goes. Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Simira. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Yusuf Dera from Mali. Um, for those who don't know where it is in West Africa. So I'll be presenting plastic waste and microplastic exposure in young children in Mali. Um, I think she already um, intro introduced the subject. Um, why are we interested in microplastics? Well, because microplastics are everywhere. So from indoor, outdoor, we are exposed to microplastics. And what do we call microplastics? Those are plastic particles that are less than five millimeters. And when they are less than one, one microliters, micrometers, sorry, we call them nanoplastics. This sub-study on microplastics was uh, conducted in Mali, West Africa, as shown here on the map. And the samples were collected in Bamako de Capacity, identified here with the square in red, and also two regions, Segu and Sikasso. So um, the aim of this study was to map the use of plastics 
in household and how people are managing the plastic waste. And in secondly, to try to determine the presence of microplastics in the water and stool samples and see what are the shapes and the abundance of those plastics in stool and water samples. For the first part of the study, we conducted a survey in households where we um, administered a questionnaire which was meant to assess the interaction of people in household with plastic items. And also how people were taking care of plastics waste. And lastly, conduct an observation in the household to see how people are disposing the plastic waste. In the second part of the study on microplastics, we collected 161 stool samples from babies aged six to 36 months, and also their drinking water, which was processed for microplastics. And the water samples collected were from different sources, um, wells, hole, and also taps. For microplastics, we were mainly interested in the shape of the, the particles and also the sizes. So for that, we did um, the fluorescent microscopy. As you can see here, the left side, we have some fragments shown um, under fluorescence. And also on the right side, we have fibers shown under fluorescence too. And we were also interested in the type of plastics that were actually in the samples. And for that, we did the Raman spectroscopy. For the sample analysis, um, the sample collection, density separation, and also with digestion, as well as um, filtration were conducted in Mali. And the following steps of the analysis were conducted um, in the Institute of Geography at the University of Birmingham. As a result, for the plastic use in households, um, here we did not mention all the all the questions that can assess the interaction of people with plastic items in the household. But what we've noticed is that 100% of households we surveyed were using plastic item in kitchen and in their eating habits. Also, 100% um, of them had um, plastic waste based on the observation um, checklist we, we, we administered in the in this study. As of how people take care of plastic waste, we've noticed that an important portion of household that were surveyed, uh, more than 56% actually in the rural area, the, the 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 plastic waste was just sprayed on the ground and not in a in a can. And we also noticed that in some household people would just put the plastic waste in a pile at a corner in the household. For the microplastics part, we've also um, collected some data on background characteristics so that we can um, do further analysis to see um, what, what are really the factors that are associated with the type of microplastics we would find in the in the stool and water samples. And when we analyze the water samples, first of all, we've noticed that all the clusters from both rural and urban areas were contaminated. So we're positive to microplastics. And the second thing we've noticed is that from the water samples, most of the plastics that were found were fragments in the, in the, in the samples. And we noticed that um, the, the mean difference in terms of number of particles per liter of water was higher in the rural, in the urban area, which was about 10 compared to the rural area, which where we have about seven particles per liter of water. And through the Roman spectroscopy, we noticed that um, four types of microplastics were actually found in all the samples that were processed. And the PMMA, PA, PE, and PS were the most abundant plastics 
and were found in both rural and urban area at higher um, rates. And we've noticed that the samples, the water samples coming from the well in the rural area um, were less diverse in terms of type of polymers compared to the other source of water um, samples. For the school samples, we've noticed that unlike the water samples, the most common type of shape of a plastic found were the fibers. And the question it remain asked, is it because the fragments were digested? Maybe, but the, the most common one were, were the, the fibers. And we've noticed that there was no significant difference between um, the urban and rural area in terms of number of particles per gram of stool sample. Also, unlike the water samples, the type of polymers that were common in water samples were the least common in stool samples. Um, the type of polymers that were common in water samples and also stool samples, um, through the literature, we've noticed that there are polymers that we can be exposed to because they are everywhere in the environment around us. So these are the, the key conclusions. I will go to the acknowledgement and then I will come back to the key conclusion and leave it for you to read this day. So before ending this presentation, we thank um, our funders, namely um, MRC, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene through the DK Found uh, Donor, Donor Crop Side Award and the University of Birmingham. And here is the team that conducted this study, the team in Mali and the team uh, in the University of Birmingham. Uh, thank you very much. So this was a really, really great talk. I'm. Everything with microplastics is so new. How do these results compare to things you'd see in other countries? Have you done any comparisons, you know, on other continents? Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, as you said, it's a new topic. Um, we did not compare the results from the surrounding countries. From what we know is that the only way, the only place people conducted some study on microplastics for now is in Ghana. And even for that, I'm not sure if they have they made some progress. So what we have for now is, a, yeah, in Africa, what we have as data doesn't allow us to compare for now. So um, something we plan to do is, as she said, initially we have like more than 10,000 stool samples and we plan to analyze more sample and to under, understand why do we have, let's say, fibers um, in stool compared to fragment and which we were, we're, we're not expecting when we look at the water samples. So for the comparison, I think we need more studies out for that. For that. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is very timely and uh, we have also concerns. This is an emerging issue, particularly in developing countries, uh, plastic pollution. Probably uh, if there are also anticipated health impacts, uh, I know you have not studied the associated impacts, but if the other studies in other countries, what is the impact of health? I think it is very important for decision makers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hi, <clears throat> sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, I noticed in your methodology, um, you use hydrogen peroxide as part of your sample preparation before analysis. And I was wondering how that sort of affects your microplastic samples. So I think like hydrogen peroxide could potentially like change shapes of like how they interact. Um, with like other particles and things like that. So I was wondering if you looked into that at all. Okay, yeah, thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, uh, hydrogen peroxide can affect the shape of the 
the plastics, but the hydrogen peroxide we use um, to make sure it's, it doesn't go beyond 34%, because we know when it reaches 50% and more, it can destroy even the plastics you are looking for or you know, distort the, the shape. So they were around 34%. Okay, and that was that was low enough to not affect your your microplastics in any way. Sorry, come again. Oh, sorry. So that was that was sort of like the threshold you found where it wasn't affecting your your yeah. samples. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I mean, a couple of things. Uh, maybe I'm going to ask about the a comparison with other countries, and then I come to that. So actually, the uh, microplastic studies, as you said, is is very very new. And across the world, there's very few studies, never mind across other countries in Africa or at MIC. As far as we know, there's very few studies in LMIC together. Um, and not many even go and analyze the level. Um, so, I mean, I guess one of the messages is please, you know, encourage your colleagues or whatever to, to do work in this area. One of the big problems we're facing in the large samples that we've got is that the um, this extraction of plastic from the residue of whatever it's in, especially stool or, or other organic matter, is extremely difficult. And that's why you need things like peroxide. And you're right, the concentration of it is really uh, quite important. We use, uh, we've worked in, with our geography colleagues who do this routinely from rivers and, and you know, soil and things like that. Um, so I guess, um, well, uh, Yusuf is more of an expert than myself, but I think, um, you're right, there is a balance where, where if you do too much, you're going to lose your plastics. If you do too little, you can't actually clean them enough to measure them. Um, it's a difficult science at the moment. But um, the other problem we have is that because they're ubiquitous and they're everywhere, actually it's very difficult to investigate the health effects of them. Because although you can work it out at cellular level or at chemical, you know, in the lab in, in vitro, and you may be able to do it in laboratory mice, for example, you won't be able to do in human beings because virtually I don't think any human being exists on the planet that isn't exposed to plastics. So it's a very difficult thing. And, uh, you know, as water, I mean, the reason this is presented in a water conference is because one of the major routes of um, uh, exposure is water, actually. So all these bottles of water we all drink from, one of the things we could do in this conference is not to have anything plastic or just promote that. You know, one of the biggest sources of use of plastic is plastic disposal containers in the world, actually, in LMIC and everywhere. Um, so, you know, I think, and the problem, of course, is that there is a huge industry driven, you know, system here, right? It's not just about just contamination with E. coli. We're talking about people who are making a lot of profit out of making these plastics. Um, so I think fighting this battle is not going to be an easy one, but it's a, for me, it's very important to present to, to different audiences who may, if you like, push the agenda through different channels, because really, um, how we're going to get rid of these is very, very difficult. You know, if you're going to have biodegradable plastic, that actually is not going away, it's just becoming smaller, which means that it goes into your body more. <laughs> So actually, it's a very difficult balance to the one kind of thing we should be promoting, certainly less production and so <laughs> Thank you. Please welcome Justin Lyle. From... Hi, I'm uh, my name is Justin Lyle, and I'm an undergrad from Virginia Tech and I'm a student in BSC. So I will be presenting on linking access to private drinking water system treatment, demographics, and water quality in Southwest Virginia. So just as an introduction, the Safe Drinking Water Act provides regulatory guidelines for those under public drinking water sources. And these guidelines include MCLs and action levels, which are legally enforceable for facilities. And they also have HRLs, GLs, and SMCLs, which are not legally enforceable. So for those that don't know, private drinking water 
It's not covered by the SDWA, and private drinking water includes wells, springs, and cisterns. So previous work is limited. I'm looking at private drinking water quality. And of the studies that are done, the contaminants of highest concern are total coliform, E. coli, lead, and nitrate. So in our study, we looked at aesthetic-based treatment versus health-based treatment. And for those that don't know, health-based treatment is looking at removing contaminants of pu public health concern, while aesthetic-based treatments are looking to treat contaminants that are typically associated with color, taste, and odor in water. And then although these treatments may target or design to, um, sorry, these treatments may target specific contaminants, it's also important to note that they unintentionally might remove other analytes. So for example, water softeners aim to remove the hardness of your water, but it actually may remove lead as a byproduct, or sorry, just as a dish. So in our project, we considered health-based treatments to be carbon filters, reverse osmosis, UV, and chlorinators, while we consider aesthetic-based treatments to be sediment filters, acid neutralizers, and iron removal, and water softeners. So just as the EPA guidelines, MCLs are contaminants of health-based or health-based contaminants, while SMCL are contaminants that are linked to water, taste, color, and smell. So in this picture, as you can see, the left is an orange colored water, which is high iron, but low equal indicator. And the one on the right is clear and it has low iron, but according to SMCL or MCL guidelines, it has indicator positive. So this is basically just showing that your water may be clear, but it still may not be safe. But the same could be said for colored water. It could be safe or it could not be safe. So our research objectives is to assess resident perception of water quality, inventory of common contaminants exceeding guidelines based on municipal water supplies, identify the most in-home treatment train combinations, and then examine the relationship between the presence of treatment and water well use across household demographics. Now, finally, we want to look at the correlation between water quality with in-home treatment and household demographics. So just as our methods, we are um, ran by the Virginia Household Water Quality Program, which works to organize local clinics and provide low-cost water testing and education for residents. We are supported and funded by the Virginia en Environment Endowment. So in our methods, we analyzed and sampled 1,009 homes from private drinking water sources across six Southwest Virginia co counties. And then we asked them, or we um, had a company survey on system design and then asked them to do an optional survey for sociodemographic information, perception, and water volumes. And we took first draw samples and then we measured with these standard methods. So in terms of the overall statistics, 80 to 90% of participants with or without treatment drink their water. And then the majority of people drink their water despite SMCL, MCL, and EPA advisory guidelines. In other words, participants perceive their water to be safe when it really may not. So I know this is a lot, but this is the overall, um, this is just looking at MCL and GLs and this is all the metals that we took. And then we showed the percent exceeding of that contaminant and then the median and then max observed. And then we have the standard for that contaminant. So the biggest takeaways here are coliform, E. coli, copper, and lead, and then sodium, which all showed extremely high percentage of violations in people's drinking water. Then we broke down SMCL and these were the highest um, these are the highest percentage of violations, and that would be low pH, copper, aluminum, manganese, TDS, and iron. So then we broke down the number of homes versus those without treatment, those with one treatment, two, and then three or more. And the biggest takeaway here is that one third of residents do not have any treatment associated with their water or with their homes. And then the health-based treatment or this graph is just showing the objective of each treatment. So if it's aesthetic based or health based. And the biggest takeaway here is that most people have aesthetic based only treatments while the majority of them have lower or have, while less of them have health based treatment. And also keep in mind the total population is 1009 
um, we excluded those who did not respond or were unsure of their treatment. So then we looked at the percentage of homes across those with one treatment, no treatment, and other for three different income brackets. And we showed that, as you can see here, the, percent, the presence of treatment rises with increasing income. So then we looked at education with those with treatment and without treatment. And as you can see, the presence of treatment increases with higher education attainment. And finally, we looked at water bottle use across income. So those who use bottled water every day versus those who don't. And then other is looking at those who might use it once a week or didn't respond or no response. And as you can see, daily water bottle use is decreasing with higher income. So then, I know this is a lot, but then we looked at S or MCL and GLs by income. So we looked at the percentage of homes under a violation, under the percentage of homes in violation under each MCL contaminant and GL, and then looked at the three incomes comparing them from each other. And the ones that are highlighted in red are statistically significant in that they're different across each income. As you can see, E. coli and lead show as income rises, the percentage of violations decreases. However, with sodium, this cannot be said, it's the opposite, which is because those with higher income typically have more treatment, and they also typically have water softeners, which actually add sodium to your water. So then we looked at SMCL violations by income, and these were all the ones that are highlighted or circled in red are statistically significant, and they all show that as, um, as income, rises, the percentage of violations decreases for that contaminant. And then we looked at violations by treatment. So we basically saw the ones that are highlighted in red, likewise, are statistically significant. And for, except for TDS and sodium, the percentage of violation increases for those with no treatment. And with sodium and TDS, the opposite is said for the same reasons. So in conclusion, Almost all residents consume their water despite exceeding health-based MCLs and even SMCLs and GLs. And an absence of home treatment, treatment was associated with lower socioeconomic status and lesser educational attainment. An absence of treatment and lower socioeconomic status were correlated with higher percentage of contaminant violations. And I would like to thank Virginia Environmental Endowment and my professor and my whole lab because they're amazing. So any questions? Thank you for a presentation. I mean, there was a lot, so I'm trying to, <laughs> no, it's okay, it was great. I mean, I took a whole bunch of pictures, so I'm gonna remind all of them later. Um, I saw that there's like, there are like people that use uh, was water softeners because I can see that there's a high level of sodium and uh, which means iron exchange. So they are like uh, to remove calcium. Um, but at the same time, you said that like 80% of people think that the water is safe. Yeah. So why people are using water softener, that for me is a luxury because to remove calcium, sometimes, I mean, I wouldn't do that in my water because calcium, I, would, I would rather have calcium than sodium uh, in my water. Um, but yeah, it's just like a question about like why people see uh calcium or magnesium as something that is not good and uh why people are installing uh water softeners in those type of water and sometimes you might have like lead e coli microbial contamination so yeah just about like perceptions so i would say well so the I go back to the regulations. So guidance, it's a guidance level and it's for vulnerable populations. So I think people, most people aren't going to be concerned about their sodium. And I think people are going to look at the, I don't think sodium, I'm not 
hundred percent sure on this, but I'm not sure sodium has color or taste with the water necessarily, while um, calcium and manganese are considered, or especially manganese and stuff like that, are SMCLs, so they typically show color if they're elevated at elevated levels. So I would say people are more concerned about the looks of their water and the actual aesthetics of their water than um, the S the MCLs or HLs. That would be my best guess, but that's something I definitely would look into more. So. Yeah, just a quick note. Uh, manganese, yeah, it's going to have color in water, iron as well, but magnesium, which is the cause for the hardness uh, of the water, so the water is hard. You know, so people don't like it when they kind of like bathing, taking a shower, calcium and magnesium. It, But for drinking, I wouldn't kind of like have like a big concern. Of course, if it's completely high, so high, yeah, that's that should be I would word, but uh, it's more like, I believe that it's more like the big companies that uh, advertise like water softeners as something that is really good. Um, but I have my own concerns about it. It's just more like about promotion and how do they sell those products? Because sometimes uh, it's just like a way of like how you see uh, perceptions, how you, what is safe. What is what is it safe? And uh, this is also a question about when you ask people if you are water safe, what exactly they understand for safety? You know. Oh, you're asking me. Um, okay. Uh, but, but, uh, sorry, so many questions. It's because there was a lot of information, so I also have like many many questions. <laughs> Not, you're right, there's no targeting. Yeah. So it's your right, but it's marketed that way. It's, that is, it's, you're not that's true. If you ask people what it's about, it doesn't mean it's not But you're right, it's not, it's the same thing, but sometimes we're not targeting. Are there any other questions? Hello. Um, how long, like over what time span did you complete the survey? And did you include, I go to Virginia Tech, did you include tech students in the survey? No. So this is, um, this is all private drinking water. So this is all um, homeowners and Southwest, all those, those six counties, they're all residents that are on private drinking water sources. So it's not Virginia Tech. I guess it could be Virginia Tech faculty that may want their water tested, but it's really anyone who wants their water tested with water, with private water supplies. And it was since COVID. It's been, I believe the project's been going on, I have the exact date I can give you, but this, this data is, it's been for a couple of years, so. Thank you. So, any other questions? We can do like one more. Uh, thanks for an interesting presentation. So as a result of this study, are you doing like education efforts to, or like outreach efforts uh, as a follow-up? Yeah, so with this program, we um, provide the low cost um, low cost education and or we provide the testing and then with our program we give them their results and if they have an MCL or SMCL violation we give them the recommendation or the advice of what to do with their water like what what exactly they can implement that might help or assist so, yes. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Um, now it's time for posters, I guess. So.
enjoy the push session.